Well, today's reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Uh, this is out of the New International Version of Scripture. The Apostle Paul writes, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not, we do not know what, to, what we ought to pray. Excuse me, let me start this over again. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through words, wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with, with the will of God. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither heights or depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are the scriptures revealing the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, I look around our world and I see an awful lot of bad news. And sometimes I just get tired of hearing bad news all the time. Don't you? Doesn't it wear you down and grind you down? Well, guess what? You're not going to get that here today. Because I've had it up to here with bad news. I want to hear something good. So, <clears throat> I look in here. In the book of Ephesians, Chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, it says this. And I pray that Christ will make his home in your hearts through faith. I pray that you may have your roots and foundations in love, so that you, together with all God's people, may have the power to understand how broad and long, how high and deep is Christ's love. Yes, you... May you come to know his love, although you can never, it can never be fully known. And so be completely filled with the very nature of God. God's love is deep. God's love is very deep. And guess what? Here's the good news. God's love has nothing to do with you. What? Others may have to love you because, well, maybe you're cute and cuddly. 
Maybe they love you because you're rich. Maybe they love you because, well, maybe you're fun to be around. They might love you because they're family and they have to. Not God. No. No. God loves you simply because he wants to love you. He chose to love you. He decided to love you. God loves you because, well, 1 John 4, 16 says what? God is love. Right? Listen to what God told Israel. <laughs> Israel, who, who would have been difficult for even the most loving of us to love. Here's what, we, what God said to them in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. The Lord did not love you and choose you because you outnumbered other peoples. You were the smallest nation on earth. But the Lord loved you and wanted to keep the promises that he made your ancestors. That is why he saved you by his great might and set you free from slavery to the king of Egypt. Now, we're all familiar with human love. We are. I mean, there's puppy love. And there's grandparent love. There's love for the arts, love for chocolate, first love. All kinds of love. And we also have all kinds of friends, don't we? I know I do in my life. We have all kinds of friends. We have some maybe fair weather friends. Maybe some long distance friends. New friends, old friends, former friends, close friends. This is human love, okay? And brothers and sisters, human love is fickle. It is. It's fickle, it's sporadic, it's temporary, and it is conditional. But God is love, and His love is unconditional. It's constant, and it's perfect. You can't influence God's love because God is love. Jesus did not go to the cross because any love you had for Him, for any influence that you placed on Him, Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says this, But God has shown us how much He loves us. It was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. Jesus, I mean, think about it. Jesus must have really loved you. Jesus must have really loved you to do what He did for you because your sins put Him on that cross. My sins put Him on that. You know, we, we look at some people, they have money, they have a good job, they have good health, they have a good life going on, good family, good strong marriage. And we think, oh man, God must really love them. Look at how much he's blessing them. But then we look at some others and they have problems. They're sick, they're poor, lost their job plagued with family or marital problems. And we tend to think, well, God must not really love them. Look at all the problems they have. Nonsense. Or as they call it in seminary, horse puppy. Forget those thoughts, people. Circumstances have nothing to do with God's love. When everything seems to be going wrong, God still loves you. When everything seems to be going right, God still loves you. If you want a gauge, if you actually need a yardstick of God's love, look at the cross. Don't look at circumstances. Look at the cross. Jeremiah 31, verse 3 says this. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. So what do we need to experience God's love? Just receive it. That's simple. Just receive it. Why? Because nothing can separate us from God's love. 
Romans 8.35, part of a reading. If you got your thumb still on it, read this with me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Look how Paul leads us up to the statement. If you go back to Romans 8.28, we read the familiar, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the calling are the called according to his purpose. This is a demonstration that of God's love that all things, all circumstances, all problems, all blessings, everything, everything, everything that comes our way is a demonstration of God's love for us. Paul then gives us a series of questions leading up to uh, chapter 8, verse 35. In view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? What a statement. What a great question. And one we probably asked. We'll need another form. Maybe we, we have asked, with everybody and everything against me, where is God? Brothers and sisters, we all face opposition in life. We all face opposition from our bodies and sickness or disease and aches and pains. Opposition from, from people who are hard to get along with. <clears throat> people who want to hurt your feelings. People who disappoint you. People who lie and malign you. Disappointment from circumstances because, hey, Things don't always go your way, does it? Right? But this question has God's love in mind. So the question is not, how can I handle what all that life throws at me? But the question truly is, can God handle all that life throws at me? Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Well, I may have many problems with life's difficulties, God is not phased. God is not phased. God is greater than anything life throws at you, brothers and sisters. Is there a problem that God can't handle? No. That's how much God loves you. The question often is not, can he handle my problems? But will God handle my problems? Paul gives us the answer to that in chapter 8, verse 32. Certainly not God who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave, excuse me, he gave us his son. Will he not also free, freely give us all things? Brothers and sisters, God in his love gave you everything you need to meet life's problems. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. Jesus loved you so much that he was willing to die on the cross for you. So, if God and Jesus love you so much to do this for you, will they forget all about you now? No way! They're not going to leave you in your time of need. No way. Not after all they've done for you already. God has too much love invested in all of you just to walk off and forget about you now. But then we ask, well, that sounds good, Pastor, but, but how, how could God love me when I'm so unworthy of his love? He sees my life. He knows how I live. He, he knows me inside out. He knows when I fail him. And, and fail to live up to his love. Oh, there, there's just too much, too much sin in my life for, for God to love someone like me. So how could God love me? Paul answered that question too with the very next question. Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Once God accepts you for who and what you are and loves you anyhow, 
Who else's opinion matters? Think about that. People might criticize you, condemn you, gossip about you, cheat you, find fault and nitpick about you, berate and belittle you, or accuse you. <laughs> I got news for you. Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 10 even says that's exactly what Satan is doing right now before God. Right now, as I'm standing here preaching in front of you, Satan's standing before God and says, look at Peter. Look at Peter. Did, did you see what he did today? Oh, did you, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said when that driver cut him off this morning? Did, did, you, did you tune into those thoughts that he had? Oh, he called himself a Christian. A preacher even. Shows you how much he loves you, God, and after all you've done for him. I got news for you, brothers and sisters. God looks Satan square in the eye and he says, I'm sorry. I don't see Peter. And Satan's he's going nuts. He's going, wait, he's right there. He's right there. You see him? And God answers, yeah, sorry Satan. I don't see Peter. Because when I look at him, all I see is my son Jesus Christ. In Colossians 128, Paul says, so we preach Christ to everyone. With all possible wisdom, we warn and teach them in order to bring each one into God's presence as mature individual in union with Christ. So let's read Romans 8.33 again. Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. God loves you so much that he does not even see your sin. All he sees is his son Jesus who justified you before the throne of grace. Jeremiah chapter 31, 34 says, I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. God loves you so much that nobody else's opinion matters, people. But His. Because no one, no one in heaven or in hell can sway God's opinion of you. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus, who died or rather was raised to life and is at the right side of God, the Father, pleading with Him for us. Who then will separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it? Or hardship? Or persecution? Or hunger? Or poverty? Or danger? Or death? Ah, uh, now the big. If any of these things come your way, hardship, persecution, hunger, poverty, danger, death, if any of them come your way, does that mean that God doesn't love you? No. 837 says, no, in all things we have complete victory through him who loves us. Mm. Complete victory. Nothing can drive a wedge between you and God's love for you. Still not convinced? Okay, Paul keeps going. For I am certain nothing can separate us from his love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor any other heavenly rulers or powers. Neither the present, nor the future. Neither the world above, or the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul was persuaded. He was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. None of the circumstances mentioned here or any other circumstance, and he just about covers them all, can separate you from the love of God. If you get nothing else that I'm saying today, please hear this, okay? You, People, church, beloved, you have never lived a single day, a minute, a second, a moment when God did not love you. 
Oh, you may have hidden in shame from God like Adam and Eve in the garden. But God still loves you. You may have deserted him like the disciples when they fled when Jesus got arrested. But God still loves you. You may have denied him like Peter when they asked him about his relationship with Jesus. But God still loves you. You may have doubted him like Thomas. But God still loves you. In it all, through thick and thin, good times and bad times, God still loves you. You never leave his mind, his thoughts, or his sight. He sees the worst in you and he loves you anyhow. Jeremiah 31 3 says, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. When you sit at the bedside of a loved one who is racked with pain or disease, God still loves you. When you sit at the graveside after losing someone who has touched your heart in life and you're hurting inside, God still loves you. When you weep because your financial burdens seem too heavy to bear, God still loves you. When you see your family torn apart or your marriage heading for disaster, God still loves you. When your heart aches, because of a great sin that you've committed and you feel that God could never forgive you, God still loves you. God could never love you any more than he already does. And God could never love you any less than he already does. You can't get any more of God's love because God is love. We think that God will love us more if we cuss less, and we drink less, we sin less. We think that God's love will be, yeah, God will love me more if I, if I pray more, or study my Bible more, or attend church more, live a better life. While these things are an indicator of your love towards God, they don't impact or change God's love for you one. I can say that because 839 says there is nothing in all creation. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. <coughs> you see, God's love is not based on you. It's based on Jesus. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God will, God will always love you as much as he loves his son Jesus. Why? Because you are in Christ. Let me close with these thoughts. Are you experiencing God's love for you? Is it real for you? Romans 5.5 5 says... This hope does not disappoint us, for God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. People, you have the capacity to know, feel, enjoy, and experience God's love. How? Because of the indwelling of the person, the Holy Spirit, which lives within you. Let, let God's love permeate your life. Wake up in the morning and bask in the sunshine of this love. Go to bed at night resting in the comfort of his love. Live in his love. Immerse yourself in his love. Fill your life with his love. Let his love overpower you, indwell you, and surround you. Never forget John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Do it for the love of God.
Amen. Amen.